Hi, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry and this masterclass video on applying plastic laminate, often called Formica, on cabinets and furniture, mid-century modern or no. You probably won't believe this, but my intent was to make a quick video of laminating these four footstools. But I ended up going deep into the weeds on the whole process, which is why this is the longest ever video here on the channel. Viewers should know that this video is intended for those who want to learn how to apply plastic laminate, not for those who want to be entertained and expect to be taught. There's a big difference between those two, you know. The former pay attention to what's going on and build their skill set. The latter post annoying comments about video length and or lack of production quality. FYI, anyone who watches this whole video will know 10 times what I knew when I did my first plastic laminating work, making all the casework for an entire donut shop back in about 1983. So you'll be well equipped to get professional results when you tackle a project where you use high pressure plastic laminate. Because there's so much information packed into this video, I made this list of timestamps to make it a lot easier for viewers to jump to individual parts of the process. Conditions Explained gives an overview of what a project needs to look like and be like before laminating begins. In Fill and Prepare Surfaces, I'll show you how to make the substrate perfect to get professional results. The cutting laminate part shows my preferred method for cutting big unwieldy sheets of laminate down into project sized pieces. Prep laminate and apply contact cement shows small but key steps for successful laminating. At five steps in, applying laminate gives you insight into what to do and what not to do in the one shot process of laminating surfaces. Next, in depth laminate trimming guides you through the use of router bits for trimming to ensure consistent results. Additional laminate application shows how to do multi surface lamination projects, which require extra consideration for success. In the advanced laminate application section, you'll see the standard dowel method of applying large sheets of laminate. And as an added bonus, I'll show you a method that I've developed for working successfully with large unwieldy pieces of laminate. And I've never seen anyone else use my exclusive method. So I hope you'll stay tuned for that part. It should be a key takeaway of the video, which I think you'll see once you understand the process and its usefulness. The video winds down with the final filing and cleanup part, which is the last thing I did to the footstools that you see here. They're 100% complete and ready for years of heavy use as footstools in operatories of a local medical clinic. And I told you this video goes deep into the weeds, so deep in fact that Chip stopped by the shop a few times along the way to help out. So join us as I wade into this master class on applying plastic laminate. In my thinking, the laminating process starts where the building process stops. Uh, these are what the boxes that you saw in the introduction looked like uh, before they had laminate on them. They're just made out of uh, one by pine uh, with a, a plywood top. And I put uh, gussets in the corner to hold some feet. But it's basically just a sturdy plywood box. Uh, these are extremely sturdy. They'll never fail that way. So as far as woodworking and assembly goes, uh, these boxes are done. But for laminating with Formica or uh, high pressure laminate, uh, the substrate needs to have some properties so that it stays where you put it and doesn't fail during use. The first of those properties is that the surfaces need to be clean and smooth. Flat surfaces need to be flat. And most important, I need to make sure there's not any voids underneath the laminate. Uh, I've got screw holes here from assembly. I didn't worry about those. Uh, and the laminate will bridge those. But if anything sharp ever hits the laminate over a screw head that's recessed, it'll just puncture through that laminate, kind of like an eggshell. Just uh, there. It's, it's hard and stiff. But if you poke it just right, it'll put a hole in it. All the corners and edges need to be very square for this to work out. You can bend laminate on a curved surface without any problem. But where there's a 90 degree corner it needs to be 90 degrees or else it'll get spoiled during the trimming process. So I need to make sure that these none of these corners are rolled off with the belt sander. Everything needs to be very square for the flush trimming process to work. You'll see that later. The other thing is that there can't be any surface uh, transitions in here. This looks smooth in the in the camera, but there's a ledge here. I made sure that these edges were just a little bit high because I want to sand those flush. If the edges were lower, 
than this surface, or, um, or if they're higher and you don't sand them off, uh, the laminate won't stick going through that step. So this needs to be very uh, flat and true without an interruption. I need to make sure that no screw heads or nail heads are sticking up. If these are sticking up, the putty knife will hit them. That puts a bump in the laminate and keeps it from sticking like it needs to. So things that stick up like this will get belt sanded down flat. Things that are recessed like these screw heads and a couple dents in the wood like this, uh, those need to get filled in before the laminate goes on. I make it a special point while doing joinery that edges like this are sticking up. You can see it here. It's just bar barely over. If this, if this piece was short, I'd have to fill that edge uh, and then sand it flush because a step in the surface um, just keeps the laminate from sticking. The bottom edges here are square and clean. I'm not laminating these bottom surfaces, but I want the laminate to be trimmed off true. Here again, this, this edge is perpendicular to the surface. That's a good practice. It's not necessary because I'm not laminating this part, but wherever two surfaces meet at 90 degrees, it needs to be exactly 90 degrees. If it's, it would be less than 90 degrees, the router bit will cut through the laminate and, and spoil it. If it's more than 90 degrees, then it doesn't flush trim right. You'll see that later. And while these surfaces need to be very clean, flat, and true when they're done. One of the beautiful things about laminate work is that you can hide just about anything in the build process, the preparation process, because uh, defects like that are quite easily resolved. And I'm going to do something a little bit shocking here and show you that if you've got damage to your substrate like that from uh, ignorance or um, interest in putting a little drama into the show, it's no big deal. Uh, it's just as easy to fix a big flaw as a small one. So that's what I'm going to do next. I did a whole video on repairing defects in wood before painting, and I'll use basically the same practices here for these repairs. Make sure to remove any loose material in the patch area so that the filler is applied to a sound surface. And then mix up an appropriate amount of auto body filler. I'm using Bondo here, but pretty much any brand will work. And a good rule of thumb is to use about a one inch strip of the hardener to set up each golf ball sized quantity of the Bondo. And then just mix it till you have a uniform streak free appearance to the filler. Working time for the filler varies by temperature and humidity, so be prepared to work fast and efficiently so that the stuff doesn't set up so fast it's unusable. I make sure to push the filler way down into the irregularities of this dent in the side. And then on each screw head, I push the filler in to work out any air bubbles that might be stuck there in the head of these Torx drive screws. The key here is to push the filler down into the screw heads to work out any air bubbles and then make sure everything is overfilled because it's easy to sand this off later. And if it's underfilled, you'll have to do a second coat to bring the surface up flush. And you can see here that I use too much hardener and talk too much, so the rest of this batch will go to waste because it's too stiff to work into these defects. I made up another batch here, and I want to show you a little trick for some repairs where you need to build up a square corner. And that trick is to use a bit of masking tape as a form. It's real easy to do. Just kind of smear it on there. I'm going to fold this edge down a little bit. Then I could just work the filler down into that spot. It's fine. I want it to actually push that masking tape loose a little bit. But the goal is to overfill that noticeably so I don't have to do a second coat. So I'm making sure that that whole corner is overfilled. And that'll just set up like that. And I'll try to work quickly and fill some more nail heads and defects before this batch kicks off. Nice one by a pine is a little difficult to come by these days. There seems to be a shortage of this sort of thing. So the pieces I was able to get for this project, it's real good wood, but it's been in the rack at the lumber yard for some time. That's why it's so beat up. It's not for me being a klutz in the shop, although it might appear that way. But the whole idea at this stage is to work quickly and efficiently to minimize waste when a batch of Bondo kicks off too prematurely. I don't know if it shows up in the camera, but each one of these screw heads burps out a little bubble of air when I press that Bondo in there. And once that happens, I know the screw head is going to be full. That's why using a putty knife is so helpful because it allows you to get good pressure for forcing the Bondo down into there, those screw heads. 
because I'm going to use a belt sander to sand these repairs flush and make sure that the Bondo is good and hard before I start sanding so it doesn't just come up the belt. Here I'm using a fresh 80 grit sanding belt and use a slow belt feed to remove the excess filler so that the only filler left is the stuff that's filling the defects. Now I can easily pull off my masking tape form and go to work. And you can see how this belt sanding action quickly removes all the filler except what's left in the defects that I'm filling in the first place. If you want to learn more about handling a belt sander for work like this, click the link in the upper right hand corner of the video screen. It will take you to a video I did dedicated to the topic. And it's important here that the workpiece be clamped firmly and securely so that the belt sander doesn't toss it across the room. And I make a special point of keeping the belt sander on the main flat surface of the side of this box so that the surface remains flat while sanding. If I were to turn the belt sander around the other way and sand off the edge, it would be too easy to roll that edge and make it out of square. You can see a bit of metal showing through here. That tells me that that screw head was sticking up a little bit and the belt sander sanded at flush. While that's not desirable, I want those screw heads to be embedded. But if they do stick up, sanding them flush like this eliminates any problems they would cause when laminating. When it comes time to sand the top of this stool that had the big gouge in the edge, I pay a little extra attention when sanding along the edge to make sure I end up with a nice square corner. I use a pencil mark to draw squiggle marks on the top and you can see when the pencil stops it shows that the edge of the side is sticking up and that's a good thing. If the surfaces are flush the pencil will go from the top across the edge of the side without stopping and what I don't want to see at this point is the reverse where the pencil would draw lines on the edge and bump into the top because a situation like that would mean the edge was lower than the top and I'd have to fill the edge to bring it up flush. As it is now that the bondo is cured and I've got these squiggle marks drawn I can sand off the top of this box so that everything is flush and all the corners are exactly 90 degrees. I sand till the bondo is flush with the surrounding wood surface and when the pencil marks are gone. No more no less. Between sanding fresh bondo and pitchy pine it's easy for the belt sander belt to get plugged up. So I use a belt sander cleaning block as often as necessary to keep the belt clean so that the cut is clean, predictable and efficient. Once upon a time I thought that these cleaning blocks were a gimmicky but truth of the matter is they really do extend the life of the belt as well as its cutting efficiency. So time spent cleaning belts pays off immediately with faster sanding performance. I use the same process to flush the top edges of the sides with the top of the plywood top on this box. Drawing the squiggle marks shows me how far I need to sand until the two surfaces are flush. The way the pencil point bumps into the edge shows me that I've got a little way to go. And I use the same belt sanding technique keeping the main part of the sander on the big flat surface and then just running it off the edge and back on to extend the flat surface of the plywood top out to the corner over the edges of the sides. The main point is to make sure the piece is secure enough so that you can apply significant pressure to the belt sander while sanding the edge flush to the top. I try to keep a low running speed on the belt because the faster it goes the more it heats up and the more it heats up the more it gums up. But the right combination will give you quick results sanding without a lot of frustration. And with those squiggly pencil marks there to help I can sand off exactly the right amount off the edges because once the pencil mark is gone the edge is gone and I can sand it all that it needs but no more. Sanding the ends of these boxes is pretty similar to sanding the top where I use a pencil mark to draw squiggles to show how much the side is sticking past the end and that guides me so that I sand off just the right amount. And you can see here on this end where the face and the edge are perfectly flush because the squiggle mark goes across with no stuttering like in the middle. The difference there is very minimal but the pencil mark highlights it so that I can get a nice clean job of the sanding process. And that quick bit of sanding leaves these repairs looking just like they should. The edges are crisp and square, flat and smooth which is exactly the right condition of the substrate before laminate. And now I've got just one more end to do on this box to finish it up. Once the pencil marks are gone I know I'm done. Well that last bit of belt sanding finishes up that part of the preparation process. I can see all the corners are crisp and clean. Here's the gouge I put in there with a hammer, smooth as can be, close your eyes, you can't tell it was there. And so um, that just about wraps up the prep work for these and uh, every laminate project is different. Uh, whatever mid-century modern type work you're doing, uh, the things are going to be different configurations etc. Um, these have the benefit of being small. If I was doing a large tabletop there's a few other things that have to be uh, considered. 
in the process, but um, the last thing I do before taking the next step and applying laminate is to take a putty knife with a clean, crisp edge and just kind of scrape the surfaces. And I know everything's good here because I use the pencil mark, uh, but if there's any edges or screw heads sticking up, they'll click loudly when you do the putty knife test. And you don't want any little bits of sand or dirt or gravel embedded in the wood. So that... So I just go once over all the surfaces uh, to make sure there aren't any um, outstanding issues before taking the next step. But I hope you can see with that the type of prep work that's necessary for good final results. I don't want to go into making a special mock-up with errors like out of square corners and dips and stuff just to show you how it looks when it doesn't work. Uh, but this shows you what it needs to look like so that it does work. And now I'm going to go back to the future and show you uh, the process for cutting the pieces of laminate for these stools, which I've already filmed. And then we'll jump ahead to the past when it comes time to start the lamination process. So stick around. I'll just take a minute here to ask that if you like the kind of content you're seeing with this uh, in-depth master class on a somewhat uncommon topic, that you'd consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. You'll find a lot of long format videos like this where I really go deep into the weeds uh, to give you steps that are necessary to get professional results on projects you're working on. And as a subscriber, you'll be noticed each time a new video is uploaded. Plus, it'll help me towards my goal of hitting 250,000 subscribers by the end of 2020. It's a little bit of a stretch at this point, but with your help, I'll get there. It should be obvious that I'm shooting the video in a different sequence than I'm producing the video. So these boxes, uh, you've already seen them get final prep, but they're not prepped yet here. But this is the time when I'm going to uh, cut the laminate sheet down into sizes. As you know, I've got uh, four of these boxes to do. Each box gets five uh, separate pieces, so I've got to cut 20 pieces of laminate uh, out of a 4 by 8 sheet of the material. And uh, I've got my cut list here, and you can see it in the screenshot. I do this cut list in SketchUp, and I make each of the laminate pieces a separate component so that I can arrange them on the sheet sizes that this material is available in. For this project, I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to get everything out of a sheet that was 30 inches by 120, or if I was going to have to buy a 48 by 96. And when you go to buy laminate, it comes in sizes, and whatever the supplier happens to have in stock is what you're going to choose from. And uh, so I want to find two things out with this cut list. One is, what's the smallest sheet I can get? And then what are my options if I can't get the sheet that I want? And that's what happened here by making these pieces just the right size with a little bit of overhang on all the uh, edges. I could get everything out of a, uh, a 30 by 10, which is a standard sheet size uh, for making countertops. You might be able to get 30 by 48, 30 by 144. But regardless, the supplier only had uh, the smallest sheet that was going to work was a 48 by 96, a 4 by 8 sheet. So that's what I got. And you can see in that drawing that I've got a fair amount of leeway for making these cuts. It's not right down to the wire like on the 30 by 120. Uh, there was a, one little scrap left over on that sheet. So anyways, I'm going to get those pieces cut out to size at this stage. And uh, for cutting laminate, uh, there's lots of ways of doing it. You can do it with a with a skill saw, if you set things up properly, uh, they make snips uh, for doing it. There's slitters and whatever, but um, the method that I like to use, just the most practical, is to use a table saw. And to use a table saw for cutting laminate, I've got to make a few allowances because the laminate sheet is flexible and flimsy uh, before it's uh, applied. And uh, it also has um, more or less a grain to it. If, when you see the back of the sheet, you can see that it's been run through a sander in manufacturing. Uh, if, I'm, if I cut this edge and tear, this, it'll just tear like a sheet of newspaper. 
and um, if you try to tear it across that sanding pattern, like from the edge of the sheet instead of from the end, it just tears in jagged pieces. So it kind of has a grain, and I'm uh, mentioning that because it's important how you handle this stuff. Uh, you can easily spoil a huge sheet and the whole project by getting a little careless or just having an accident in handling. So uh, I need to um, keep that in mind when I'm getting set up to cut the material. The other thing that is important that has to be dealt with is the fact that the material is so thin. Uh, I don't think it's even a sixteenth of an inch. And what that means is when you go to cut it on a table saw, if you're ripping it on a table saw, the edge will almost certainly slide under your fence and screw up the cut. So the way I work around the sheet being so thin is with this piece of uh, sheet metal bent at a 90 degree angle. Uh, for my rip fence, I've got a little hook on here. And this thin angle doesn't throw off the width of the cut uh, by very much, and it prevents the sheet from sliding under the rip fence. In this close-up shot, you can see that my thing is kind of dusty here, but this hook and this lip just help the fence stay hooked so it doesn't slide through. With different fence designs, you'd have to come up with a different system, but it's important that this piece stays engaged on the fence when making a cut. Another cool feature of this little setup is that this auxiliary fence slips neatly into the end of my unifence extrusion for storage when not in use. And because laminate is so thin and floppy, I also have to compensate for what happens to the laminate after it comes off the table saw. Um, people that have a outfeed table, dedicated outfeed table, don't have this sort of problem. But for my shop, with all the versatility it needs, I've got to have a different setup. So I've got a roller stand here. And then I just use another piece of sheet goods as a temporary outfeed table. Uh, it doesn't have to support much weight because the laminate's light, but it just has to control it so it doesn't fall down and um, tear or anything while I'm making a cut. So with this auxiliary table and that auxiliary fence strip, um, I control the laminate during the cut. So it's a lot easier to manage. I'm using a 60 tooth crosscut blade in the saw with a blade stabilizer, which probably isn't necessary, but it can't hurt. And then I'm using a zero clearance insert for making these cuts. Just keeps everything under control and clean during the cut. You can get away with less of a blade and less of a zero clearance insert by just using a little caution and maybe a slower feed rate while cutting. So that's my setup for making these cuts. And I'll say that if by some chance I had to start out with a 4x12 sheet or a 5x12 sheet and I could make an initial cut, I would probably do that by using a skill saw or circular saw for making the cut. It's kind of a different setup and I'm not going to go through it here, but the bigger the sheet, the more unwieldy it is, the more likely it is to get a tear in there and spoil something. But uh, for this project, this setup is going to handle it. I'll use my uh, little blue Atlas show us Smurf gloves for handling this stuff because it's a little bit slippery on the top surface. And similar to cutting other sheet goods, it's always helpful to lay things out ahead of time and make an initial cut to reduce the overall size as quickly as possible in the process. So that's what I'm going to do. If you've not bought laminate before, what you'll find out is that uh, the suppliers store it in racks either on edge or laying flat. But when you purchase it, they'll roll it up tightly like this uh, for transport. And when they do it right, they put a slip knot in that little loop there. So you can just pop that loose. But uh, keep in mind, there's a fair amount of tension in that roll. And you don't want to just let it fly because it can flop and react and tear. So hang on to the stuff. And just let it uncoil at a reasonable rate and you'll be just fine. When I'm just uh, doing a project and not shooting video, um, I don't always take this step, but I'm going to uh, just do a rough layout on here with a pencil so that I can pre-cut the sheet and make sure that I'm not uh, missing something by being distracted by shooting video. So I'm just going to sketch the pieces out, of here, out on here 
uh, on my cut list, I've got, uh, I need eight pieces, nine inches by 12 and a half. Uh, I'm just going to figure those at 14 inches long, uh, 10 by 14, because I've got plenty of extra material, like I said, because I had to buy a 4 by 8 sheet. If I was using the 30 by 10, I'd have to dial this in a little closer. But ultimately, if I can end up with a sheet that's a half bigger, a half inch bigger in both dimensions, width and length, than the surface I'm covering, that's just perfect. Um, so I'll just do this layout quick here before I make an initial cut to hack this piece down. And keep in mind that these edges are thin and can tend to be sharp. So as I'm sliding my finger along the edge, I'm using very little pressure because I don't want to get a bunch of DNA smeared over this nice clean sheet. And a regular old sheetrock square can be handy for this sort of layout as well. And if you miss mark like I just did there, a little bit of lacquer thinner on a paper towel takes those pencil marks off quick and easy. And lacquer thinner doesn't hurt the surface of that melamine in the least. And marking the wrong side of the T-square blade like I was doing is just the sort of mistake that you can make and never notice it until it's way too late. And with that initial rough layout done, I'll double check all my sizes to make sure the count and size is right before making an initial cut through the scrap here between the pieces. Well, I've confirmed that I've got eight ends, eight sides, and four tops, which is exactly what I need. So I'll get set up to make this first cut. I'm going to cut 29 inches off the end of this sheet. Rip fences is set at 29. Get my Smurf gloves on here. And I raise the blade up pretty high, way higher than normal for making this because the sheet can flop around and uh, it gets kind of tricky if the blade drops out of the cut. The blade height's about an inch. And if the sheet was any bigger, I wouldn't be able to do this. But I can here. And keep in mind, this really isn't a finished cut. I'm cutting these pieces way extra big. My only goal is to chop the end of this off. And I'm just doing this to show you it's possible uh, because there's a lot of ways this can go wrong. And uh, if you're new to it, probably better off using a snips or a skill saw. Yeah, that cut kind of goes into don't try this at home category. But here I've got a rough cut sheet for the eight ends. And then here's the four tops and the eight sides. Next cut I'm going to make, I'm going to, um, actually I'm going to cut the 20 inches off this side. Final answer, I'm going to cut this down to 40 inches first. That lives me with a slightly bigger cutoff here, not that I'll ever use it. And I'll emphasize here that um, I could go to a lot more work of setting this up to make this a little less sketchy. If you had another person, that'd be wonderful because I can hold that edge down along the fence and guide things better. Uh, but you know, it, this can be done. There's plenty of margin on the pieces uh, for cutting, so I don't have to you know, worry about spoiling an edge by an eighth or even a quarter of an inch. And I can just work these, uh, these sheets down into smaller, uh, more workable sizes, which is what I'm doing. When you see the material binding and hear it binding on the blade, that's a dangerous situation. Uh, this can kick sideways and get bound up in there and kind of make a mess out of everything. I got the blade extra high. Um, you know, if you have a blade guard in there, uh, or a, a shroud for dust collection or something. That's just going to complicate matters. So um, I'm just showing you how I do this a lot of times, but make sure any decision you make for cutting this stuff, uh, you do it within your comfort range uh, for safety and procedure. And I just keep breaking the bigger sheet down into a smaller one, making sure that I've always got a straight edge along the rip fence.
this stuff definitely cuts better with the curled face facing down. So you'll see here where I check my cut width, then flip the piece over and cut it upside down. The 60 tooth blade makes a nice fine chip free cut, but even chips don't matter because this all gets trimmed off with a router later in the laminating process. As the pieces get smaller, they get easier to manage and the cuts come out more true. So this is the time you want to think through your comfort level and your workflow and your margin of error to plan out how you make the initial cuts and the final cuts so that you don't end up hurt and so that you don't end up damaging pieces and rendering them unusable. And with all these pieces cut to rough size, I can unwind my setup here and um, I'll just talk about uh, laminate was really big uh, through the 1990s more or less. I've done acres of this stuff, um, cut all kinds of it, all kinds of ways, um, encountered about every kind of way to screw it up as possible. And so I don't want to be cavalier about uh, the way I'm cutting it here. I know this works. I know I can do it this way. It's going to be fine. But uh, I'll emphasize that whatever measures you take, uh, just make sure you're safe uh, primarily and are comfortable with the steps you're going to use to do this. If I made a bigger outfeed table, uh, that would be one thing that would help. If I had a helper to hold the other side along the fence, that would help. I've used uh, feather boards on that in the past for different stuff, depending on the sheet size, etc., what I need to do with it. So this is kind of a down and dirty way of getting this part done, but adjust your methods and workflow accordingly. And it's times like this that I do get a little bit jealous of people with uh, shops that are in a garage mahal and they never have to worry about a temporary setup. They can just leave everything set up all the time for this sort of work or for a cabinet shop where they have a dedicated uh, laminate section. They're prepared for doing this quickly and efficiently and consistently where I haven't cut laminate in this shop for probably a couple of years. The first thing that goes through my mind when starting out uh, to laminate a project is sequence uh, because uh, one sheet goes on first and the next one goes on after all the seams are lapped. Uh, they're not mitered, they're all lapped and the way the lap is arranged matters. Uh, for instance, uh, these are footstools and so I want to make sure that the top is lapped over the sides because if it's the other way around, if the sides come up past the top like this, somebody's foot drags off the edge, it just peels that laminate loose. So I want the edges to be lapped where the, the wear or the normal use won't tend to pop the edges loose. Uh, so the top will be the last piece that goes on. Uh, the other lap joints um, will be the sides and the ends. I don't really want to go side end, side end like that to put the laps like this around. Uh, so put the ends on first and then put the sides on and then like I said do the top last. Uh, I just think that'll be the best sequence uh, for this project but that's something you've always got to take into consideration. On a regular countertop uh, basically you would do the ends first, the sides next and the top last also uh, for the same use purposes but that can vary on some projects. So just keep it in mind. After sequence, the next most important thing is hygiene. This laminate, um, this is a Pionite brand, not Formica, not Wilson Art, not Nevamar, uh, but they're all made the same way and uh, it's a very hard and durable surface, but um, it doesn't conform. If you get a, a speck or a wood chip or a piece of sawdust, a chunk of wood on the surface and you put the laminate down, the laminate will stick but there'll be a pimple in there forever and always. So you got to make sure the surface is clean and I'll show you how to clean that before we apply the glue. Also want to clean up uh, the laminate pieces. When it's cut on a table saw or however it gets cut, there can be loose chips on the edges uh, and things can stick to the middle. So I make sure to clean that up first before applying the contact cement. Cleaning up the laminate before applying glue is very simple but you want to have a good system and be methodical about it so 100% of the surface gets cleaned up. The best way I've found to make sure everything is clean and to remove any loose chips is with a sharp putty knife. 
And one viewer in particular is going to recognize this putty knife. The first thing I do is to clean up the edges. And I do that just with a simple scrape. And that removes any chips that were left behind by the table saw. And then I just cover the surface 100% with that sharp putty knife. And that removes any chips that might have got embedded or stuck to the surface. And the process is just that quick and easy. The process of removing the chips from the edges like this keeps them from getting picked up by the glue roller and then dropped somewhere in the middle of the sheet, which really makes a mess when you get a pimple in the middle of a big flat surface. And this process is easy and takes so little time, so it's well worth the effort to ensure that your glue up is chip free and proud. And every once in a while I hear a little click and I know that I've loosened up a chip or a chunk that was stuck on the back of this laminate. And it probably doesn't show up too well in the camera, but that sharp putty knife actually does bevel that edge just slightly. You can see these little bits that come off. And all those little things that come off is the stuff that's likely to stick into the glue on the roller and kind of spoil your project. So the time spent cleaning up those edges and the backs is time well spent. Like I mentioned about the sequence, I'm going to do the ends of these first. So I'll do the same cleanup prep on the ends of these, except I'm not going to scrape the edges. I want those to remain sharp and crisp. So it's just a matter of giving the ends a quick wipe with that sharpened putty knife, just to make sure there's nothing uh, stuck on there or embedded in the wood. On bigger surfaces you can scrape, on smaller surfaces the wipe is usually pretty good. And as long as your knife blade is straight and sharp, you can hear a distinct tick when it pulls something off that surface that you didn't want there. And I'm only scraping the ends right now because after each sequential piece of laminate, um, the next surface to be glued and laminated needs to be scraped clean. At that point, just to make sure that nothing's getting stuck on there or embedded in that surface in, the, uh, in between the steps. Well, it's a good thing I titled this video a master class for laminating because otherwise I'm not going to get much grace for going this far into the video before actually getting to the laminating part. Uh, but here we are. When I do this laminating, I like to use contact cement. Some people use spray adhesive. There's different types of contact cement. There's a solvent based and this one's a water based. I've, I started out way back in the day using the solvent based stuff and uh, lost plenty of brain, brain cells working with that. But the solvent based stuff is great. It goes on thinner. It doesn't skim over as fast. Uh, it's got a real long shelf life in the container. Uh, and it's thin and it's easy to work with and it holds like crazy. Uh, so I've got this uh, 3M Fast Bond bought in a gallon jug. I am using just a regular nap roller. This is probably a 3 8 nap roller. It's an old one. Um, when they're smashed down a little bit or a shorter nap, uh, they're a little better. Using a roller pan and actually an old roller pan liner that I've used before for this glue. That's all good. Uh, when I'm in uh, production mode, I like to do as many surfaces at the same time as I can. Uh, like on these boxes in production mode, I'd, I'd glue and laminate both ends at the same time so that I've just got one uh, drying trimming cycle in between. But when I'm in teaching mode, I'm going to try to do it so that it's a little less hectic and I'll just do one end at a time because there's enough going on with the process as it is and I don't need to get into all the extra steps that it takes to be able to laminate two opposing surfaces at the same time. So it uh, doesn't take a lot of glue, but that lid can get very tight because it's contact cemented on. Let's see if I can get it off with these without breaking it. 
that's pretty good. And I think it demonstrates that contact cement never really does get hard like wood glue. Uh, it's, it's thin and rubbery, so it never does get brittle and flake. But you can see it there. It's about the consistency of evaporated milk. Not that I use evaporated milk that often, but that's about what that looks like. And uh, putting this stuff on is kind of like rolling paint, not a whole lot different. I like to get the roller good and saturated, but not so much that it's running off the roller. I'm going to put these boxes down here on the footstool so you can see what I'm doing. And over the years, I found that the best place to apply the adhesive to the back of the laminate is just by turning it backwards on the surface it's going to end up on. So I'll just roll the contact spin on here. You can see it goes on like kind of like milk. I want to have a full coat. I don't want to leave streaks and globs. But I don't want to starve anything for glue either. It needs to have a nice evenly rolled on surface like that. Any chips that get on this surface at this point are going to be there forever and always unless you see them and pick them off. But that's what properly applied water-based contact cement looks like on the laminate. And I'll do the same thing on the wood surface. In this case, often you're using particle board or MDF to laminate to, sometimes plywood. I don't like plywood because it's kind of splintery. And that's all it takes. I'm trying to minimize the amount of glue. The camera battery died as I was finishing up that last side. So I'm going to do another one here. Just kind of rolling off these edges here, making sure that I don't have streaks or dry spots. Just a nice even coat. On a larger surface you can roll in two directions to get even distribution. But this is a case where more is less generally. You don't want too much on here. I try to minimize the amount of glue that runs off the edge. You can see I got a little carried away there. So I'm just going to take that sharp putty knife and scoop that off while it's wet. Got a couple drips down there on the stool. But that's a nice even application of glue. Uh, with an even application like that I get consistent drying so they don't have wet spots or dry spots. They're drying out of sequence. I got a couple little crumbs there that came off my fingers. Get those off the surface here. And that looks good. I just set these aside to dry. It's kind of interesting to me that there are adhesives and cohesives. And contact cement is a cohesive because it only sticks to itself. So we're putting this stuff on wet like this. And only when it's dry is it ready to stick together. Got a few chips on the edge there from the belt sander. I'll make sure those don't end up in the soup here or in the sausage, I guess. But I'm just getting these rolled out. Clean up these edges. And last but not least, I'm going to leave these pieces big like this. I cut them extra wide just because I could. I had extra material. I wasn't worried about it. But you can see how much I'm going to have to trim off on these sides and on the end. So um, I'm going to leave these big just so you can see that it's possible to trim that much off. But when I do the rest of the sides, I'm going to retrim those pieces down to a size that is a little closer to the actual finished size. So I'm not uh, having to route off all that extra. I intended to do that before I got to this stage, but Space it out, so here we are. And production shops that do nothing but laminate all day long will generally spray this glue on, adhesive, cohesive. You got it in a gun and a pressure pot, but you kind of have to have a dedicated spray area. And I find that this just works marvelous. In a small shop like this, I can. Uh, just do a batch at a time uh, without getting the mess spread everywhere with a minimum of equipment. So it works really nice. And uh, air movement is the key to drying this stuff. And I want to minimize that air movement. So 
I made this uh, just sheet, it's like plastic cardboard, and I put it over the roller pan like so. Minimizes air movement in the pan, it doesn't skin over, uh, but this stuff here is just out in the shop with air circulating, and it'll dry that uh, glue off. And you can see these pieces here, this is the first one I did, it's starting to get translucent. And this is the last one I did, it's still milky. So when everything looks like that spot, it's good to go. Because the wood is somewhat porous, the contact cement is tacky and dry here. This is about ready to go, but uh, this milky stuff, anything that's milky like that just won't stick. Just, there's no, uh, no cohesive about it. So uh, I'm going to stop the camera here uh, for a while, let this dry because nobody likes to be accused of being as boring as watching paint dry. And that applies to watching contact cement dry. But I will take a minute here while that contact cement is drying to remind viewers that in the video description is a link to an Amazon influencers page for Next Level Carpentry where I list the various tools and supplies you see me using here. Uh, those are at the same low online price you expect. But Amazon pays small ad fees to Next Level Carpentry for purchases made through those links. So if you need this stuff and you can't find it locally, go through those links. It helps support the channel and I appreciate it. So here we are. Dry glue, dry. I kicked the furnace on to kind of speed up the drying process and have some warm, dry air blowing across these. And in the meantime, I want to talk about router bits. I've got two bits here. They're both quarter inch shank with large bearings. That keeps them from gumming up so bad uh, with the contact cement on the edge. Uh, this first bit is a flush trim bit. The bearing and the cutters are the same diameter. I'll be using that first to trim off the excess laminate around uh, the ends of the stools. And then I'll get into this later. This is a 22 and a half inch bevel bit. Still got some glue on there from the last time I used it. But those are the two bits I use to do the job of trimming the edges of the laminate. Another tool I'll use, I might as well describe it now, is this knife file. I had a heck of a time finding these, but these are available through McMaster Car. It's got a very narrow triangular profile. There are teeth on the edge. This acts like a saw blade. There's no teeth on the backside, so filing into an inside corner. You only file the surfacer after, but it's got an aggressive but smooth uh, cutting action, which is perfect for laminate. I switched to a quarter inch collet and this Bosch router, and I'll chuck up the flush trim bit first for the initial trimming. I want about, oh, a good eighth of an inch of cutter exposed there. Any less and the bearing gets gummed up any more and you risk damaging the face of the laminate that you're flush trimming against. You can see the stages of drying here. We're about 10 minutes in or so. This is dry enough. Any spots that are milky aren't. This is the first piece I put on. This is the last one. Uh, this milkiness on the edge needs to get dried up and hopefully another cycle of the furnace will get it there. But you can see if it's not dry, it just comes off. But if it is dry, it's just got this barely tacky feel, but it doesn't, it doesn't come off. It's important at this stage not to let any dust get on the surface because just a thin layer of powdery sawdust will keep these two from sticking together. But when this glue is clean, as you'll see, once that stuff comes in contact with the other side, you have to pretty much destroy the piece to get it to come apart. At this stage, the contact cement on the wood is dry sufficiently. A little bit of a milky spot there, but that'll go away. I'm going to watch these crumbs from my fingers. But the difference in the drying time is because the wood is porous, like I said before. And I apologize about going on so much about watching glue dry, but it really is important to let it dry the right amount. Uh, there's a, fair, a fairly long window of time from when it gets like this, where it's essentially clear, uh, to when it won't stick anymore. Uh, I don't know, half an hour, hour in between there, it's probably fine if it's not too hot and dry. But you can, ki can kind of tell uh, that surface just stays tacky even though it looks dry. 
if I don't explain all this and you go to laminate something together while there's still milky spots on there, it doesn't stick. You wonder what the heck you did wrong. So I just want to make sure that th all that is clear and I won't bother you again with this explanation on the subsequent glue uh, sequences. In order to speed this up, I put the shop fan and the furnace on it and it took less than five minutes to get this stuff all uniformly dry. No milky spots to be concerned with, uh, but then it's still just tacky enough to use. So we're good to go. It doesn't really matter which piece of laminate goes on which end. All the glue is in the same drying cycle, so there's not a problem there. And I'll work down here on this footstool again, just so you can see what's going on. And because I made these pieces plenty big, I don't have to be very careful about the alignment. Uh, there's no pattern on here. It's just a straight neutral color. It doesn't matter which way the sheet lays out. So they're both dry like this. I got no nibs to cons be concerned with. So I'll just lay this sheet on here and flop it into place. Just like that. That's all it takes. And you can see that that is just totally stuck, uh, even with just light hand pressure like that. Now I'll take a J-roller and roll this out. And because I've got so much extra on these edges, I've got to be careful. If I roll way out here on the edge, I could crack this. So I just want to put pressure, concentrated pressure on the, on the corner like this. Just a slight angle down all the way around the edges. And that really sets the adhesive right there at the corner. And then I just use firm pressure in the middle. The bigger an area you have to do if you're doing a whole countertop, you have to really concentrate on getting uh, uh, pr even pressure everywhere. But on these little stool ends, that's all it takes. And if I wanted to take this piece off, it would, it would destroy either the wood or the laminate in getting that off. That's how the glue sets once it's dried to the right level. I'll go ahead and flop the rest of these on there. I've got this kind of big wob of glue on the edge there, so I'm going to make sure that gets trimmed off. Just stick this on like that. Quick roll around the edge. It's just a slight angle on the roller to bind up or to really force the pressure on that edge. And if you think of it, you know, if you can put a tenth of your body weight on that roller, you know, you get 15, 20 pounds on there, you got less than a square inch of contact. So you're putting 15, 20 pounds per square inch on that to get that cohesive to stick to itself. So it really sticks. And it sticks right now. And I've lectured about cleanliness, uh, but there is one remedy. If you happen to get a chip in there and you don't know it until you do that, you feel that and you feel a, a pimple in there. All is not lost. It's just not good. You don't want to make it a habit, but you also don't have to abandon the piece. The way I would deal with that if there was a chip of laminate under there, or a bit of sawdust, I take a smooth face hammer with a slight curve to it. I don't want any sharp edges. And wherever that pimple is, I just give it a sharp wrap down. And if it's a chip of laminate, that stuff's pretty tough and the wood underneath is pretty soft. So it'll just drive that lam laminate chip down into the surface of the wood and that pimple will virtually go away. That works 90% of the time. Once in a while, uh, if the substrate is too hard, or the chunk is too big, uh, you don't get away with it and you have a pimple. And that is not a fun situation to be in. But we'll get finished up here. And this is the part where you'd notice if you had a step in that finish that wasn't filled, or if we didn't sand those edges down, the stuff just won't stick. Um, it, it can stick on either side of it, but underneath that, that contact cement it won't pull it in. It'll just forever pop loose. So uh, the reason this is working so well is because of the prep work. Spent a lot of time getting that just so and you get the result like this. You want these edges stuck down now with that roller because when we go to trim this it'll 
it'll throw uh, shavings underneath there and then you'll never get that laminate to stick again. The contact cement is kind of a one-time shot. Another great thing about contact cement is once it's dry and you stick it together, you don't have to wait for it to cure or dry or anything, not like clamping wood glue. Uh, this is as stuck as it can be right now. Just because of the odd shape and size of this, I'm just going to clamp it to this work surface to do the routing. That'll hold it firm. Because getting chips in the glue is such a big deal, I want to make sure my glue pan is a long way away from the flush trimming process so don't get any glue chips in there. It's like having a fly in the soup. It is not a good thing. I'm going to use my little stool here because I'm a little bit height challenged. But I've got this in place. I've got the flush trim router bit in the router. And I'm going to trim this edge off. I might have to set the camera up at a different angle, but with the large diameter flush trim bit, this cleans up pretty good. The amount of laminate that's hanging off here is greater than the diameter of the bit, so it's actually going to be cutting a slot. That's moving a lot of, removing a lot of material, uh, but that's okay. I'll use a steady feed rate and even pressure. Um, it's a good thing that the way this is set up, if the router tips down, it only pulls the cutter away from the work. It won't gouge into the edge. If, if the router tips in, you could tip it enough to scallop the edge, uh, but that's, it's really hard to tip it in. It'll, it can tip out fairly easily. But uh, the router direction is cutting. I'm going to push the router to let the bit pull itself into the work. If I try to go the other way, the router will just take off and not do a good job of trimming. So all that's going on when I make this simple flush trim process. And I don't care for the noise, so I'm going to use earplugs. And it really doesn't take much more than that. When I, um, when I pre-trim these other sheets so that I'm only taking off like a quarter or three-eighths all the way around, it'll, uh, it won't work the router as hard. It'll be a little smoother operation. But I did want to show you that eh, it doesn't matter. You can do it either way. I let this happen on purpose. Um, you can get globs of glue building up on the bearing. Didn't do it too bad. There's some here. But as that glob of glue goes around, it pulls the cutter away from the surface and you get this scallopy edge. That's kind of a mess. So after I've taken the initial pass, I'll follow around again to clean that up a little better. And if there's sticky chunks, you can always use a putty knife to clean those off. so that the router does a little better job of trimming. But in this case, it wasn't too bad. And the next couple of steps will clean this up just like it needs to be. Uh, these edges are, are crisp. They're, that's sharp enough to cut your finger. If you rub on that corner, those need to stay that way. This is just like it needs to be, but be careful of this edge. If you were to drag it across something, it, it could catch this and it breaks like, like catching your fingernail. So be careful of that edge at this stage before it gets lapped with that second layer uh, of laminate coming over there. It's, it's strong but delicate, so just be mindful of that at this stage of the game. Well, uh, gluing and trimming those doesn't take much time at all. I am going to go ahead and uh, trim the pieces for the other ends down and then I'll go ahead and get those glued on and show you how much better the routing goes with the smaller pieces but I'll pick it up then. I need exactly seven and a half for the sides of these boxes so I'm going to go eight and a quarter and that will give me three eighths of an inch margin around which will be less trimming with the flush trim bit but still be enough margin so I don't have to stress while positioning the pieces on the contact cement. Using the same logic, I need 12 inches of length on these ends. So I'll cut them at 12 and 3 quarters to leave 3 eighths inch for trimming all around. And I think you'll agree that it's a whole lot easier to trim off that excess material with a table saw than with a flush trim bit in a router. Well, it's a second verse, same as the first. I got Chip going warp speed over there, re-scraping the edges of those small pieces after I trimmed them, uh, cleaning everything up, blowing away 
the dust, uh, scraping the other ends of the boxes, uh, blowing all the dust off of that, and then applying the contact cement to all those surfaces to let it dry. And it's amazing how fast that guy can work when he's properly motivated. I told him once he gets that done, he can go home for the day. So he's really getting with it. <laughs> nice work, buddy. Appreciate it. Should be all good to go and ready to route when you uh, want to get up off that stool and get back to work, huh? <laughs> we'll catch you later. All right, Chip. I appreciate it. I'll get this stuff routed off in the morning because it's kind of noisy to be doing at this time of night. But it's sure nice to have all those pieces stuck on and ready to go at this stage. So after Chip got all this laminate prepped and stuck on, I'm going to route these off and you'll see how much different the routing goes when I've only got three eighths of an inch or so around the perimeters of these boxes. There's still little globs of glue and stuff on the sides here. Uh, as long as they're not too big, that's no big deal. I'll just uh, clean that up with the next step. I'll mention a couple more things while I'm thinking about it. Um, if glue builds up on the router bit bearing, uh, it makes the edge cut trim lumpy. So just take a sharp putty knife or a razor knife and roll that bearing and it'll uh, loosen that glue up. Uh, if you've overdone the glue or if you're using a solvent based contact cement, it's more glommy. You can always spray uh, this flush trim bit with a healthy dose of WD-40 when the bit is clean and that'll keep that glue from building up and sticking so much. You can see some of that glue build up here. I let it do that on purpose. It's kind of glommy. Sometimes you can just let the router bit spin free and that stuff will fly off of there. And other times it just needs to be scraped off. And a quick pass with a glue free bit cleans that irregularity off in no time. With that initial uh, laminating and trimming taken care of, uh, we're going to go into a couple more things about uh, trimming laminate and that's going to involve using the bevel trim bit. It's the 22 and a half degree three wing cutter I showed you a little while ago. And the purpose of that bit is to remove sharp edges uh, so that fingers don't get cut and so that the edges don't chip. The uh, end of these boxes, uh, the sides and the top, are going to get another layer of laminate. So I need those corners to remain crisp and sharp. But the bottom here, right now it's flush trimmed, but there's still a slight edge on here. Uh, and if the stool gets in use um, and something catches that edge, it can chip the laminate on the bottom. And of course, I want to prevent that from happening as most, best I can. So I'm going to use the bevel trim bit to trim just the bottom edge here that'll get exposed to wear. And I want to show you a couple things about the purpose of a bevel trim bit. I'm going to do a 10x magnified view drawing to help explain the way that this uh, bevel trim bit operates. So let's call this the square edge of the box. And we just laminated a piece on the edge like this and then use the flush trim bit with the bearing here to cut this piece of laminate off to trim that flush. So we did that. So this is where we're at now with this layer of laminate on here. And this laminate is sticking over just slightly, which is what I'm trying to show here. So uh, on the other three surfaces of this box, I'm going to belt sand this so it's perfectly flush and the square corner moves from here to here. But on the bottom of this box, where I've got the three quarter inch wood here and the laminate here, I want to trim this off with that bevel trim bit. And if I trim it like this, there'll still be a little square edge right here that can catch and chip. So the goal is to trim just ever so slightly into the wood at 22 and a half degree angle like that so that it goes from laminate just to wood before it turns that 90 degree corner. That way when something like a shoe or a threshold on a door goes here, it, it deflects off the wood before it gets to the laminate and tries to chip it off. And the way you adjust that where this cutter goes is by changing the height of the bit. The farther down the bit is, the more that takes off. So I want to, I'll experiment 
starting out very slight and dropping the bit ever so slightly until I get the perfect depth setting to trim off all the laminate and just the slightest amount of wood. And I might as well explain this here and now uh, regarding the other edges. Uh, here again, this is the, the box. We're going to flush trim laminate on one side. We're going to lay another piece of laminate over the top. And then we're going to flush trim that off also. So we'll have this. And there's generally when you're done flush trimming, there's the slightest amount, just a couple thousandths of an inch of laminate sticking over. But that's the part that will tend to make this chip. So again, we're going to use the 22 and a half degree bit and cut this off. And when it's a laminate to laminate seam or edge or corner, I'm going to take that bit and set it so that it takes all of this off and just the slightest, slightest bit of that square corner. And that eliminates that little catch point that tends to chip the laminate. And this is why having square corners here is so important. If this corner is out of square, I'll exaggerate here. If the corner is uh, out of square, this laminate gets trimmed like this after it gets belt sanded. You lay this piece on top. And then when you go to flush trim this, the flush trim bit bearing rides down here like this and it'll cut this off like this and it spoils that laminate by cutting off this corner. If the joint goes the other way, here I'm exaggerating again, the side laminate gets trimmed like this. You put the new second layer of laminate on, now the bearing rides down here like this and this gets flush trimmed here leaving an even bigger catch point on here and that needs to be filed back manually so that's not a catch point. So that's why square corners are so important. I hope my little almond board drawings here help you understand what we're doing at this stage of the game. And I'll point out that on the square corner example, the difference between just enough and a little too much is just a few thousandths of an inch. So things need to be really crisp, clean, square, and accurate to not spoil this piece of laminate when this piece gets bevel trimmed. If you have a choice, err on the side of not enough because you can dial this in with a file, which we'll do as well. So I adjust that setting a couple times until I get the depth just right. So now the laminate is beveled along with just the slightest margin of wood. So that this edge won't catch and chip the laminate outside of extreme situations. Once I've got that bit depth dialed in and the router locked, it takes just seconds to put that protective bevel on the bottom edges on all eight sides of all four stools. And it's important not to make this bevel cut on these edges. You can see there's a gap in here. If I had to put another piece of laminate on this, there'd be a gap that corner wouldn't meet. So it would be a very large mistake to run that bevel on anything but this bottom edge. I realize that these steps are probably getting a bit tedious, but they are important. So I'm going through uh, this deep in the weeds so that you know what to expect and what you're going to need to do to get professional results. Um, now that these bottom edges are all beveled, they're not going to snag. I don't want to flip this piece over and try that because this edge is good from the flush trimmer, but it's not perfect. This will stick up a little bit. You can see there's globs of glue on here. And in this case, you can see from the squiggle marks that that laminate there is actually sticking up just a little bit, mostly from this glue making the flush trim bit bearing uh, not ride right on the wood. This end is better, but still there's little things on there that catch. Same thing on the sides of the box here. And the way I'll deal with that, again, is with the belt sander. I don't need to be so dramatic with pencil marks to emphasize that, but I do want you to see why I'm taking this step, next step. So to get the laminate flushed up and these edges, corners cleaned up, I'm going to switch back to the belt sander. Uh, there's very little material that needs to be taken off here. So I've switched to a 100 grit belt for a less aggressive cut. Um, I make sure that the sander is staying mostly on this surface and I just extend it out to pull that edge off of there and flip the box around, do the same thing on the other side. You'll see it doesn't take much at all. Um, I want a fine cut belt, but not a dull belt because I want it to shear that off there. Um, the mistake to make here is to let the belt sander go forward and tilt it. If this edge gets belled off, that laminate will never stick down when we glue the sides on. And 
And that's the type of square corner I'm looking for. This edge right here is like a Ginsu knife. If you rub your finger across there, it would just slice it wide open. That's crisp and square. There's nothing here to catch an edge. So it means that these two surfaces are lined up and we'll get a nice, clean, crisp, tight glue line when the side piece of laminate gets laminated across this end. And now I'll just flip and flop the box, twist it and turn it till I've got all the edges of the end laminate pieces flushed with their adjoining surfaces. You notice that I've slowed the belt speed way down because the higher belt speed was just melting that contact cement and gumming up the belt. And that's all it takes, uh, just a quick wipe with the belt sander to clean that up and give us the best results when putting the second piece of laminate on. And I hope you don't mind the trip into the weeds with these little details because these steps aren't hard to do, but they're necessary to get excellent results in the end. If you skip one of these steps, you kind of end up with a marginal job. And once you have these in your head, they just become routine. This is just what you do uh, to prepare each subsequent layer of laminating. So I'm going to get the rest of these cleaned up and stick the sides on. Well, Chip offered to come back for this routine bit of applying contact cement to the first sides on these boxes because this is basically third verse, same as the first two. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about trimming this laminate off when all the pieces are glued up and glued on because there's a couple little details in the process that I think you'll want to be aware of when you're doing multi-sided uh, projects with plastic laminate. I think I'm going to go grab a donut. And I don't know how it is that he always gets to go take off and get a donut when I'm stuck here working, but I think I'll go grab one too. Best thing to do while the glue is drying is take a donut break. Everything's dried up here after about 10 minutes or so with the fan and the furnace going. And uh, one thing I've got to remember here is that my pieces are cut a little closer to size so I can't be so uh, cavalier about the way I drop these on here. As long as I got a little sticking off on the edge, I just flop them down like before. Remembering that there's this handhold thing in here, I don't want to crack the laminate while going around that edge. But that's the only difference on this. And just stick these down. Same as before to get them ready for flush trimming. I think I've already mentioned that for doing larger uh, pieces, there's some other considerations. For positioning the sheet, you don't want any to, anything to stick before you're ready for everything to stick. On a large piece, that's a little uh, tricky to organize. Pretty much everybody uh, that talks about it talks about using dowels to suspend the glued pieces before you start sticking it in place. That's definitely a good way, but it's not the only way. If I have occasion at some point, I'll do another tutorial for advanced techniques and cover the method I use for that and those extra considerations. But for a lot of projects, you don't have to do anything more than just be a little careful when you're dropping that piece down to make sure you got laminate hanging all the way around. And trimming these is pretty much routine as well, but I'm going to show you one where I go through that handhold because it's just kind of cool uh, to watch the laminate take the shape of the substrate. And naturally, I start the flush trimming process here with a straight flush trim bit, make a lap around the piece to take off that extra material. And obviously there's nothing to that. Now I have to think through what's going to happen on each of these edges. Uh, the bottom edge, like before, it's not getting laminated on the bottom, so I'm going to use the bevel trim bit at the current setting that I used on the ends to trim this bottom edge. But the bit's probably set a little too deep for trimming a laminate to laminate corner, so I'm going to leave those go. Naturally on the top, uh, it's going to get the belt sander treatment.
You can see the edge before and after here that shows clearly what this little bevel trim step is doing. And once the bevel trimming is done, I'll use a putty knife to scrape off that residual glue for a nice clean finished edge. And now with this side all trimmed up to this stage, these pieces are all ready to flip over and laminate the other side. Once those are flush trimmed up in the same fashion as this, I'll come back and talk about the top a little bit. I've fast forwarded a little bit here in time uh, to the point where I've got both sides laminated and flush trimmed. And I need to finish these sides off to get ready for the next layer of laminate. Uh, I used the, the flush trim bit with the setting I had to trim the laminate on the side to the wood on the bottom just like I did on the ends. But then uh, for trimming laminate to laminate on the corners, I need to raise the bit up to take a shallower cut. It's a very small setting, makes a big difference. So I raise it up extra high and then just sneak down until it's making the right cut where it's, um, where it's beveling the edge of the laminate and not the face of the laminate on the end. I think you'll see what I mean here. I've got this dialed in to where it's making that cut and I'll zoom in here so you can see what this process looks like. This is what it looks like after the flush trim bit's gone by. Uh, there's still a little bit of glue on here. I can carefully scrape that off with a sharp putty knife. If necessary, on second thought, I'm not going to recommend using a putty knife for removing this extra glue on here. It's too easy to scratch the surface of the laminate and damage it. But I do recommend using a sharpened laminate chip. I did a video a while back on how to sharpen these laminate sample chips to use as disposable scrapers. And you can see here just how quickly and easily this works. And the good part of it is it's guaranteed not to scratch the face of the laminate because laminate will not scratch laminate. But the goal is to bevel the piece of laminate but not the face of the laminate. I've got a very shallow setting on this bed. It's hard, you can hardly even tell what it's cutting. And you can see right here that that bevel bit is just barely touching the face of the end piece, but it's cleaned this off and you can see the, the transition here. And that almost imperceptible transition is the cut diameter of the router bit. This has been bevel trimmed just like I want it and that has only been flush trimmed. You can see how little this is taking off. And you can do the same process with uh, the knife file, the laminate file. But starting it off with the router bit gives a perfectly consistent bevel to start with. If you just do it with the file all the way along, it's harder to get a consistent look. I will go over all uh, these beveled edges with the file before I complete the project. You'll see that later, but the laminate bit starts everything off right with a nice consistent cut. I'm making sure not to touch this top surface with that bevel bit for the same reason I didn't want to uh, do that before. That gets laminated on there and has to be a square corner, not beveled. Not sure if I mentioned it, but uh, the bevel setting on this wood, I wanted, to, uh, I wanted a deeper setting to cut some of the wood. If I was to use that same setting on the side, it would take off enough of the laminate color on that face and make that corner look sloppy and I'd have to redo it. And that's all there is to it. I might as well introduce you to edge filing at this stage because I want to do these corners uh, with the file to clean them up. In normal production, I would just do all the filing at the same time, but I'll uh, bring the subject up here, show you a little bit what I'm talking about, and you can see when and how it gets applied. I don't know how much it'll show in the video, but this corner uh, it has got a slight texture to it from the router bit. Uh, this top edge is very sharp still, even though it's beveled. And to change those two things, I'm going to use a laminate file. This is a knife file. These are available from McMaster Carr. Uh, it's a very thin triangular profile. It's got a smooth but aggressive cutting face on it. It's got no teeth on the back edge. These I use specifically for filing laminate. And to treat a corner like this, I'm just going to hold the file at roughly a 22 and a half degree angle and make a nice smooth pass across the edge and then roll this outside corner. Just one light pass to take the sharpness off there. I'm pushing down and over. You can see how the color of that changes. Maybe you can see that in the camera. But I'm filing away the router marks and then 
One pass like that knocks down that sharp edge and rolls the actual melamine surface, rolls it into the phenolic core of this, all the while not damaging the color face on the end here. If I file too much, this darkened line gets wider as the color face is uh, filed off that side piece. But the result here is that there's absolutely no catch point on this edge so that when this stool's in use, nothing that rubs past here hooks the laminate on the face and peels it off. I use the same filing technique where the laminate meets the wood on the bottom. This has been bevel trimmed. Um, I take a couple of passes to clean off the router marks. One pass to take the sharpness off. And then on these outside, outside corners here, those things are so liable to catching things that I actually give them an extra roll so it looks like this. Uh, that's not my the desired look because I like to make it crisp and sharp and square, but those things catch so easy and tear the laminate that I take this preventative measure and file that. For curves like this, I just use a smooth round file. for the same purpose, to remove the sharp edge and to remove any edges that will catch. In this sharp corner here, I'll roll that a little bit as well to remove that sharp corner. And there's more filing to come as I finish up the piece because that's one of the final things I do is just go around and make sure everything's been filed smooth so nobody gets cut and I minimize the chance of this chipping from things getting caught on those edges. Uh, this next step will come as no surprise to anybody that's been watching and paying attention. I've flush trimmed the sides to the top, a little bit of residual glue, a little bit of roughness there, and I'll clean that up with a belt sander just like I did on those initial pieces on the ends. Keep the sander on the main surface and just move out over that edge to sand it off by pulling it back. I'll flip the piece around and do the other edge rather than trying to accomplish the same thing here. If a belt sander is going off the face of that laminate, it can pop the facing off. So I'm careful just to do the edge where the belt is pulling into the surface, into the laminate color. When this bit of glue is gone, I know it's flush, but keep in mind it's real easy to tip the belt sander at the end and round that corner off and you'll be hating life. You can see how little it took to get that cleaned up. I was going to fast forward through this whole section, but there's some other stuff I thought you might find helpful. For all these surfaces, uh, it's not quite um, 32 square feet, 4x8, 32, probably around 28 square feet. Uh, I'm using maybe a strong quart, three pints of uh, this contact cement. A little bit goes a long way. Uh, I've scraped all these surfaces with the putty knife, make sure there's no chips. Uh, I've scraped the edges of this, you saw me do that. And uh, just rolling this stuff on here, nice, quick and easy. On these I'm kind of going two different directions, just to get the edges and try not to slop too much on the edges. So that works out. You can just set these pieces aside to dry. Uh, and I wanted to mention that um, I'm, because these edges here are the edges of a pine board, and this is the face of plywood, all this contact cement lays on there, dries, soaks in about the same amount. If you're doing stuff with particle board, and a whole lot of countertops and stuff are, uh, a lot of times I will double do those, uh, the particle board edges. So if this was particle board around the edge with the open grain of the edge cut, I would roll the glue on here, roll it on all the pieces, and then I would go back and roll on another coat on that particle board just to make sure that it really gets soaked in there. Uh, it's important because with particle board edges, there's a lot of stress on edges. Anytime the laminate's going to chip, it's generally uh, on the edges. So you want to make sure you got plenty of glue there. And if you just do one coat on a really porous surface, and it soaks in, you're not going to get the same uh, bond performance from that as you will if that porous material is really well saturated with the contact cement. It takes just a little bit more, one more pass on those surfaces 
but it's worth it. And that being said, uh, it wouldn't be beneficial to add another coat to all this wood. More uh, doesn't really help. It makes the, the glue joint on the edge where the laminate comes together. There's just a thicker layer of that contact cement in there. If you double coat this stuff so it's not necessary, that's the point where uh, less is more. But with uh, particle board, less is less. So I wanted you to have that piece of information. And I think that's about that. And I'll show you a couple things when I'm applying these pieces of laminate. I wanted to cover uh, a couple of tricks for doing a large surface. So I'll just kind of pretend these pieces are bigger than they are. And uh, show you a couple techniques on that when this glue is dry enough to be put together. Woohoo! Now that I'm done applying the contact cement, I'll mention a few other things about cleanup. I'm scraping the excess off here just because that tends to gum up the router bits when I'm cleaning that up. So it's nice to have the majority of that off. I've got a lot of glue smeared on here. That'll clean up with lacquer thinner. You'll see that after a bit. But uh, I did want to mention that I've used disposable stuff here. I don't generally do this, but um, just want to show you that you can pour the excess back in if you've kept this covered and it hasn't gotten coagulated in there. That's worth doing. Of course, if you got any uh, chips in that pan in the process, you wouldn't want to do that because you don't want to be putting chips in here in the bottle and you could never filter them out effectively. Uh, the roller itself is shot. Even though this is water-based, there, there ain't no cleaning this thing up. I just pull that out of there, drop it in the pan, and that disposable part goes to the landfill. Part of the cost of doing business. Uh, the roller itself has got some wetness on there. You can just wipe the majority of that off and then once this stuff sets up, you can actually use an eraser to rub that dry glue and it kind of rolls it up in a little, a little ball, makes it come off there. That's one way you can use lacquer thinner, etc., to clean that up. But other than that, uh, the water-based is wonderful because it doesn't stink the shop up. It doesn't, um, it doesn't skin over and stuff. I mentioned some of those properties before. It is rather expensive. Um, I haven't checked on this lately. This stuff has, I've actually had this in inventory for like four years. It's fine in the bottle, but it's rather expensive. You might have to order this stuff online. I know I did last time because no local suppliers carried the water-based, only um, small cans of the solvent-based stuff. Um, anyways, that's that. I'm going to let this stuff dry and carry on. Well, I've fast-forwarded again to the point where all this contact cement is all Nice and dry, no milkiness, just translucent contact cement. And I'll show you the way uh, that I put on a piece that's actually this size. I've got enough margin all the way around so I can do this just like before by aligning the edge, just making sure I got room on the ends and the side. Flop it down, good to go. A quick roll around the edges seals them up. And then good pressure throughout the top. Sticks that contact cement together forever and always. Just like it should be. And I'll flush trim this later. But what I want to demonstrate here is what happens when this piece, instead of being 12 by 20, is uh, 4 feet by 10 feet. Uh, it's a lot harder to deal with that. It's too hard to line up an edge to get the right margin all the way around. And I can put this piece on here upside down without a problem. Uh, so uh, the, the goal is to position the piece where it's going to go and not let it stick like that. Position the piece where it's going to go before starting to stick it down. So you need something in between here uh, to allow the sheet to move without touching the glue. And the most common solution that you see, you see and you see talked about is to use dowels. You can just lay dowels on that surface like that. Don't have to be very big, but they do have to be clean. It's a mistake to just pick a dowel up off the floor and lay it in there uh, because uh, it can carry chips with it. Next thing you know, you got a mess going on. 
and the sheet has a natural bow to it like this. So if I have the dowels going the way of the bow, it can touch in the middle in between the dowels. So I would generally put the dowels at 90 degrees uh, to the bow in that piece, lay the piece on there, do all my wiggling, and then pull one dowel out, stick a corner down where I know it's good, make sure the opposite corner is lined up. I can still move this piece a little bit, uh, so I know this corner over here is good, so I'll pull the middle dowel out and stick it. And once you've stuck that much, you're pretty much done. If you did it wrong, you're probably going to spoil the sheet and have to do a bunch of backpedaling. But that's how dowels work for the process. Nothing wrong with that. But there are times, like with a four foot wide sheet, you might need a dowel that's four feet or eight or ten feet long, depending on how uh, the sheet is bowed. And that reality right there is why I'm going to show you this next tip. Put our next guinea pig over here. And I've never seen this trick done by anyone anywhere before. I'm sure somebody's doing it, but uh, this is my version. And I start off by going to my handy ceiling mounted extension cord organizer and slipping off an extension cord of moderate length. If you like the looks of that extension cord organizer, check out the video link there that will show you how you can make one of your own along with the carney pole. But uh, I've got this extension cord and basically what it is is a flexible dowel, 24 feet long. Like the dowels, I want the extension cord to be clean, so I'm just using a little lacquer thinner on a, on a rag, and then I just snake the extension cord back and forth across the project. And of course it looks a little bit ridiculous here because this thing is so small, but you get the idea. I've done the same thing with, you know, four foot wide, five foot wide pieces of laminate on L-shaped uh, cabinets, all sorts of stuff. It works like a charm. The one thing you got to make sure is that you keep um, the plugs on the same side. You don't want to have to pull a plug through under that laminate. So as long as the extension cord is clean and it's laid out like this, you can just drop your piece of laminate on there. Nothing's going to happen. You can wiggle it around and do everything you need to do. And it operates the same way as a dowel. I just start pulling the cord off on one side stick down a corner that I know is good. I can just pull the cord out the rest of the way and my piece is stuck in place. No muss, no fuss. And it doesn't take much imagination to see that that little secret there will work on pieces of virtually any size and any shape. And one extension cord will take the place of a whole bunch of dowels and it can also be um, laid down very close to itself, weaving back and forth. You get a 100 foot extension cord uh, and you could cover up an amazing piece where that would take quite a bundle of dowels and you don't always have dowels on a job site, especially if you forgot to bring them one day. And that day you might think of maybe using an extension cord instead. Anyways, so there's that pro tip. I've got one more piece to uh, stick on and do some routing. And it's just as easy to put that cord back where it belongs as it was to get it down in the first place. I've got everything flush trimmed and the excess glue scraped. I wanted to show you one thing here where uh, the flush trim bit, I didn't get real close to the edge. Kind of left some extra hanging over here that's not quite an eighth of an inch, but that can be trimmed off with the bevel trim bit as well. It's just cleaner, quicker, and easier to do it with the flush trim, but I'll show you how that looks. I've still got this bit set to the very shallow setting for just going through that laminate. And with that, you can see that bevel trim bit is capable of taking off far more than I've left here. But the less it has to remove, it just makes a quicker, cleaner, and smoother cut when you do it. 
And chip's long gone for the day, so I've got to finish bevel trim routing these tops all by my lonesome. Something I neglected to mention all the way along is make sure that your router base is perfectly clean. If you have a grit uh, from sandpaper stuck to the bottom of that disc or anything, a little piece of metal or sand or dirt in there, and you go and laminate these edges, you'll have a nice little scratch going all around those surfaces. And don't ask me how I know that. And once all the gluing, sanding, flush trimming, and bevel trimming is done, your laminate project is ready for a final detail, which involves first cleaning up excess glue, smudges, and pencil marks, etc., with lacquer thinner. Probably a good idea to use a protective glove of some sort for the process. And you can see the general grubbiness here. Various uh, glue smeared around. It collects dust. Here's a pencil mark. Um, but I've not worried about that stuff anywhere through the process because it comes off so easy at this point. Just get a good soak of lacquer thinner on a paper towel and give it a wipe. Heavier spots like this, you can give them another scrape with a laminate chip to kind of speed up the process. Like that. Make sure you got good ventilation going on in your shop because this stuff evaporates and stinks. And this is the time when you'd be paying the price if you didn't clean up the extra contact cement when it was wet. I've still got enough on here to clean up, but you can see it comes off without too much trouble. Although I did save myself a bit of work by getting the biggest globs off earlier. And in another irony, it's a small project like this that actually has more cleanup than a big one. If you're doing a whole countertop with edges, um, there's more open surface than there is seams, but in this job, uh, there's probably more seams than there is open surfaces. So it takes extra cleanup, but um, it still doesn't take long, and that's what it should look like at this stage. I do need to file these edges. They're a little sharp, and these corners are a little too sharp. So I'm going to get that laminate file and show you a few details on that. I don't normally get the luxury of clamping the project in a vise for this sort of work, uh, but I'm doing it here because it'll be easier to demonstrate what's going on. There you've got a good detailed shot of this corner. You can see how sharp this is. If this was in a display case and never got used, uh, that sharp corner is okay because it looks really nice. But in the setting where these stools are going to be used, that thing will chip off of there in no time. So I'm taking my knife file, laminate file, and giving a pass or two on the laminate edge, like that. One on the corner to smooth it off. This is hard to do with the camera there. I'll do the end like that. One pass to take the sharpness off. Do the same on this end. And I'm always filing down and in on the laminate because I never want to turn the file this way and go like this because it can chip that edge in pretty short order. And then a sharp corner like this, I'm just going to roll the file and round that off ever so slightly. Just like that. If you go too much, all of a sudden you're into the wood in the corner and it looks bad. But that little detail right there smooths that corner off so that it's a whole lot less likely to catch and chip anywhere in its lifetime. And I try to keep the file going the long way. I don't want to have the file going across like this. It tends to dig in. The more of the file you have on that corner at the same time, the smoother it makes that file's cut. That's the one that knocks that down. And just the ever so slightest amount to ease that corner. One thing you can see, if this will focus, there's a direction or an angle to this, the cut in this file. And I try to use the cut so it's going across that angle. If I turn it around and it follows that angle, it tends to serrate the edge. That's going to be hard to understand, but when it happens to you, you'll know what's going on. And that little bit of filing is, to me, the final step in a laminating project. We've gone through a lot of gears to get to this point, but I hope that you've learned tips in here that make your laminating work go quicker, easier, with less stress, and better results in the end. 
After an hour and a half, I'm now back to the spot where I was when I shot the intro to this video, but now you know what it takes to get professional results like this with plastic laminate. Long videos like this are possible in part because of the list of patrons here who support Next Level Carpentry through Patreon. Everyone on this list goes above and beyond with a pledge of support to the channel, which I really appreciate. To express my appreciation, I continue to build a library of in-depth, behind-the-scenes videos that these folks have access to as patrons of Next Level Carpentry. As I see it, it's kind of like a good magazine subscription. Lots of content for a good value. A big part of that good value is the fact that patronage income mean that no ads run on the videos in the library, so patrons get to watch video series like the Master the Joiner series that I did without any interruption. Sweet as a self-licking ice cream cone, isn't it? I hesitate to admit it, but I'm tired of talking, and you're certainly tired of watching. So, for now, as always, until next time, thanks for watching. And I guess there is a bit of irony here, because I'm using a laminate chip for scraping chipped laminate, and chip isn't here to use the laminate chip for scraping those laminate chips. That's kind of confusing. Maybe that's why he went home early.